the screen. This is from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. It speaks to us of God's faithfulness. And uh, get your book or look on the screen and let us sing together this great hymn of God's truth. <laughs>
fill in if you have a prayer request. You know, these are connect guys, and they really want to connect with the people here. So if you have something, it would be a great time to just mention it to them, and they can follow up if they want to, and you can ask for that. Because, you know, there are a lot of people here. Let's say there were only, well, let's say if there were 100. I don't know that there's quite that. But that would mean they would have to do, in five days, they'd have to do 20 calls to connect with all of you. And that would be a lot. So this is a way to connect without, um, you know, giving it so much and um, as much as they would love to. So for our first time guests, you just have to fill out as much information as you're comfortable with. And there's a little box on the left side. If you put that your first time guest, they will give you if it's still here. <coughs> Pastor John has one, but it's not as nice. Hardcover, the story about it. So it's very nice, it's just a Bible story form, and like he said, um, we're going through it, um, the whole Bible, but in a consequent, con how do you say that, in sequential form. So you get to have a sweet condensed version of the Bible, but with everything in it. So um, we just want to make sure that you uh, get that, because it's a great way to learn the Bible. and. There's also a place if you want to sign up for a growth group, like Pastor Judy mentioned, that we have available. They're a great way to have fun, to meet people, and to learn more, and to really study the Bible together, which, which really helps, because people feed off each other in these groups, and it starts to have a um, synergistic effect of learning, so it's great. So thank you, and enjoy today. Thank you, Joyce. And the connection card goes now for the beginning of the service. We'd like uh, the kids to come up now. I think I'm ready. The kids to come. Owen and Brenna. This is Lydia coming today. And that's Blake and Jason, Surprise and Williams. You're going to be, it's crowded, isn't it? Why don't you kids? You guys gonna stand? Can you stand there? There's no place to sit. Well, we have Bible story books for the story for the kids. And today in Sunday school and in the class later, we have these stories, and there's a couple of main characters in the book. All the adults know who they are. I'm going to tell you about Jeremiah. You know anybody named Jeremiah? Ezekiel's the other one. Do you know anybody named Ezekiel? Well, they're the main two people in the story. And Jeremiah is a prophet. That means he declares, he tells what God says. And Ezekiel has the same job. Ezekiel tells people what God says. So we have Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And both of these men had experiences with God. They saw God and they knew God. And God told Jeremiah something very special that applies to every one of us. God said, when you were still in your mother, I knew you. That's the message of Jeremiah for kids. Is that even before we were born, God knows us. Never forget that. And then Ezekiel also saw the Lord, and he had a vision. Uh, Jace, I need some help. You want to come by me, Jace, and help me? No? <laughs> don't have to. How about Williams? Will you help me do that? Thank you. Why don't you hold this up? I'm not sure how this is going to work. This is a picture of me. guy's kind of all twisted up, isn't he? Actually, it's a picture of me. Do you know that? <laughs> well, that's what's inside. It's a picture of all of us, actually. That's what we look like inside under our skin. And Ezekiel had a vision of a bunch of bones like this. And they're all twisted up and out of order, and they were all lying in the field. And God said to Ezekiel, can these bones live again? And then Ezekiel said, I don't know. 
Doesn't seem very reasonable, does it, that bones can live in here? So Ezekiel said, oh, you know God, I don't know. And God said that as the word of the Lord came, all these bones would come together and live again. Now, I don't know if you know that you look like that inside. It's kind of scary, isn't it? I got this for Halloween. I don't think I'll use it because it might scare me. And then people think, oh, that's a look inside. But God has life for us. And that's the message from Ezekiel. Is that God can take something that has died, something that's gone, and make new life again. That's our hope of the resurrection. Do you know what the word resurrection means? That means that we'll live forever and we'll come back to life. And that's God's promise from Ezekiel. So for the kids today, we have two men, Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, the message is, even before you were born, God knew you. When you were still in your mother, God knew you. And then Ezekiel is that even later, after this life is over, we will live again because of God's love and God's promise for us. So all these kids up here, and you too, God knew us before we were born. And God has a plan that even after this life is over and we're just bones, He'll give us new life again. So let's pray for the kids that they will always remember these truths, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for these beautiful children. Children that you knew even before they were born. When they were still in their mother, you knew them and planned their lives for them. Thank you, God. That's the message from Jeremiah. And thank you that you could take bones that speak of eternal life with you forever. So I pray for all these kids. life forever with God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, one of you can see me afterwards, I might give this to somebody if their mother says it's okay. <laughs> but it's time for the kids to go to Sunday school. We just prayed for them. And let's bless them as they go. And pray for Mrs. Vanderveen and she has all these kids with her. Now it's time for the video. King Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, was only 12 years old when he became king. He was very different from his father, doing all sorts of evil things. He led the people to worship false gods and even built an altar to Baal inside the temple of God. Things got so bad that God brought the Assyrian army against Manasseh. They put a hook in his nose and led him away to the city of Babylon as a prisoner. In his suffering, Manasseh humbled himself and prayed to God. God was moved by his prayer and allowed Manasseh to be set free and return home. For a few years, things began to improve, and the Israelites began to follow God again. They even discovered the book containing all of the laws of Moses, which had been lost for many years. The people learned once again what it was like to live in God's ways. But soon, things got much, much worse. The kings who ruled over Judah once again led the people away from God. Then one day, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, attacked the Israelites, nearly destroying the temple Solomon had built. He captured almost all of the Israelites, including the best warriors, workers, and artists, and sent them to Babylon. Only a few of the poorest Israelites were allowed to stay to take care of the fields. God sent two prophets, Jeremiah, to those left in Jerusalem and Ezekiel to those living in Babylon. Unfortunately, the news was bad, 
Because they had done so much evil, God allowed the city of Jerusalem, their home, to be almost completely destroyed and the rest of the Israelites sent to Babylon. But the prophet Ezekiel told the Israelites living in Babylon that God would not forget about them, that God would one day rescue and restore them. God even gave Ezekiel a vision that he was standing in a valley full of bones. There was a rattling sound, and the bones began to come together, and tendons and flesh appeared on them. Finally, God had Ezekiel command the breath of life to enter the bodies, and they came to life. God told Ezekiel the meaning of the vision. These bones are the whole house of Israel. I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am God. We are in chapter 17, as you have heard this morning. We have some good things to share with you. It's always encouraging to know that God is working to bring us back to Himself. Have you noticed the times that we kind of drift away a little bit and kind of do our own thing and kind of forget about God and kind of don't get much in His Word or don't take much time to pray? Have you ever had that happen? <laughs> we do, don't we? We're human beings. But God is always working to pull us back, to draw us closer into His presence. There was a passage of Scripture today that fits nicely with what you just saw. And I'm going to ask John to come back. If you want to move it back just a few slides, Dale, to that passage of Scripture, and I'm going to have Pastor John read that before I bring the message this morning. It's in the, it's in the sorting book, and it's page 245. If you have your book, you can follow along as I read, or you can just listen. It's the bottom paragraph on page 245. Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. Thank you. That was part of the prophecy that Ezekiel brought to the people of Israel when they were in exile. And our story today deals a lot with the two prophets, with Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And we're talking about them just a little bit, but I want us to take a moment to think about how great the Lord is, who He is, and who we are as His people. And God blesses us with years of life, doesn't He? And we have, today, we did not mention it yet, but I wanted to mention that we have people that have birthdays today, right today, and one is your dear Irene Eiler over here. It's her birthday today. And it's also Keith Stokes, he's in the back. And we have, um, there's one more, Morgan, Henry Morgan, it's his birthday today, right? No? Not sometime soon? This year. <laughs> All right, we had it in our records of his birthday today, but his mom says, not quite right. It is today. Oh, okay, it is today. There's three of them right there today, and I think some others coming this week, and some had last week, so we all have birthdays, don't we? But today, those three that are special in our midst, so we greet them and pray for them today. 
As we think about how God has given us birth, even while we were in our mother's womb, it says, God created us, ordained our days. And He has a plan and a purpose. And you know how much God wants to be in our lives, to be with us, to love us. And it started way back in Genesis, when He wanted to be with Adam and Eve, His creation in the garden. And then it went further with the people of Israel when they landed in Egypt, they were in slavery. And God wanted to be with them, and as He led them out of slavery to freedom, to their own land, He wanted to be right in the midst of them. The tabernacle, the place of God's holy presence, was right there, and then all the tents where the rest of the people lived were around that tent. God wanted to be dead center. Maybe that's not a good term. Center, right in the midst of His people. And so we have that promise that Pastor John read that he will call these people back from exile where they have gone of their, their own rebellious will away from God's presence. And he's going to call them back sometime. There's going to be this uh, remnant that is saved, that is, is still open and hearing God's message and wanting to seek him and find him. And he will bring them back. But to this point in the history that we've been looking at, the scripture, through the Old Testament chapters, we're on chapter 17, all those previous chapters, we see how hard it is for the Israelites to honor and love the Lord. Do you remember on the way back to the Promised Land, what did they build when Moses was up on the mountain? For 40 days and 40 nights, he was getting the commandments. You know, we know the Big Ten, but there were several others. Commandments that the Lord was giving them so that they could have a covenant together. That they could share life together. That they could be in God's presence with Him. And they agreed to do that, except then when Moses was there for 40 days and 40 nights, they said, well, where is this guy that's supposed to be leading us to the Promised Land? And they built this calf. They kind of went back to where they were from and began to worship the gods that they had there. And their hearts were drawn away again, and they drifted away. And it's kind of this pattern of the Old Testament, isn't it? And we see now that because God said that if you continually don't want to be with me, okay, you don't have to be with me. And they were allowed to go into exile. First they were taken over by the Assyrians, as Pastor John preached last week. The world power at that time. And a few years later, here we are, Judah. And it's, I was thinking too about parents and children. Uh, John and I are parents. We have two sons and we have how many grandchildren right now? We have ten and one on the way. And it's just a little overwhelming at times, but it's wonderful. They're wonderful people. But as you think about your own children, did you ever have to discipline them? Of course you had perfect children. Didn't you? Just like we did. But there were times when we set boundaries and we said, this is the rule and you will abide by it. Did we say that? Anybody? There's a yes over there. Two of you did. Okay. We did that as parents, didn't we? Because why? We loved our kids and we didn't want them to get hurt. We wanted to protect them. We wanted to make life as good as it could be and we wanted them to become citizens of our nation, but also citizens of heaven. That they would live and love their maker. Now we expect children, as our children, to obey their parents. We can set the rules, the house rules, right? That's what we do as parents. And as we relate that thinking to our Heavenly Father, God is our, our, our parent, basically. He's the one who created us. He made us. He designed us. And it isn't his ability then to set the house rules? Can God say, okay, I'm the parent. These are the rules that we're going to abide by. If you're going to live in my house, if you're going to be with me in my presence, these are the rules. So God did that. But as he was doing that, the children kept rebelling and kept running away and kept saying, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to do this, I'm going to worship the gods I want, and I'm going to do all these other things, even if it doesn't please you. And that was 
that happening in the Old Testament. And as we see that happen again and again, that they led, the kings of Israel led the people away, much like a parent. I think I have a scripture from Hebrews that talks about our parents trained us for a little while. They did what they thought was best, but God trains us for our good. He wants us to share in His holiness. No training seems pleasant at the time. In fact, it seems painful. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Painful. But later on, it produces a harvest of godliness and peace. It does that for those who have been trained by it. Warning signs. Have you heard of the Titanic? I think you all have. Has anybody seen the movie a long time ago? Anybody? A lot of you do. You know the story of it. It was a wonderful ocean liner. And on the evening of April 14th, radio operators on the Titanic received a message that they were headed toward this iceberg. They were warned several times. Repeated messages of warning came to them again and again. But the operators were busy because they had these people on board that wanted to get messages back to their loved ones, telling them how great a time they were having on this world's most luxurious passenger ship. Several attempts were made, and yet another attempt was made to warn them of impending danger. And the Titanic's operator, ship's operator, he in Morse code typed back, he said verbatim here, shut up, shut up, I am busy. And we all know the rest of the story. The operator was too busy to heed the warning of the iceberg. Over 1,500 people died that day. We have this picture of warnings and somehow we get too busy to listen. We're too busy in our lives to care or heed God's word or his values or his presence. And so God is gracious and kind to try to scoop us up and love us and get us back to know Him, to love Him, to walk with Him, to be with Him. One of the kings in Judah was a very evil king. There were 38 kings over Israel. We have another map here I wanted to show you. On the right side, you can see the, 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 the 12 tribes. Those were the sons of Isaac. And as they went into the promised land and they set up, settled there, there's Simeon, Judah, Reuben, Gad, Manasseh, Ephraim, Dan, uh, Natalie, Asher, and there's 12 of them in all. Those 12 re regions, which are pretty much today present-day Israel. But as we see those geographical areas, then we also see that on the right side it shows the divided kingdom. You see the top 10 those top 10 geographical areas were what were known as Israel. Their capital was Samaria. So when you're reading and see those words, you'll have a better perspective, I hope. Uh, and the southern kingdom was Judah, where the Jerusalem was the capital. And Benjamin was the other tribe, Judah and Benjamin. So the northern kingdom had been taken captive, taken into exile because they no longer were serving the Lord. And much like a marriage, when you stand before the Lord and make a covenant, you make vows as husband and wife, right? You vow that you're going to what? What are the vows of marriage? Tell me some. What? Love, honor, obey. Okay, what's some other ones? Cherish till death do us part. And what happens then when maybe one of the spouses has an affair and goes with somebody else. That's the picture that God is giving us of his people, his children, and his relationship. That's why we're called the bride of Christ as the church. Jesus is the groom. There's all this analogy that we understand because we understand marriage, we understand how hurtful 
adultery can be, or people who have gone through divorce, the pain of that. And God wants us to be with him in his presence. He wants us to share in those vows that we both take together, to be in that fellowship. And so as we see, the kings of Judah and Israel did not encourage. Only five of 38 were those who encouraged to be with God, to love God, to honor Him, to serve us, serve Him. There was Josiah, who was a good king. He brought reform. This was after Manasseh. Manasseh was more evil than even the nations that they were to drive out from the Promised Land. Those heathen, evil, I think John used the analogy of people like Isis. People that were very wicked and that would kill and destroy. And they even burned their children in the fire to sacrifice to their gods. They did just all these vile things. And God said, because of those things, you do not want to be with me. You are forsaking me. You are leaving me. So God sends these warnings. He talks through the prophets, through Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a prophet who was about 17 years old when he was taken into exile. He was studying to be a priest and to do the service in the temple of the Lord. And as he was taken, he was the one that encouraged people to turn their hearts back to God, even in exile, because he knew the promise of God. He knew, great is your faithfulness, O God. He knew about that. And he knew that the dry bones, he was the one that prophesied the dry bones. You Pastor John's skeleton up here, they were all together there. But that thing wasn't living, was it? This piece of paper. And the Israelites were regarded as those dry bones. You know, do anybody know that old song, the leg bone, what's the hang, something connected to the, the neck bones connected to the shoulder bone, the shoulder bones connected to the arm bone, you know that old song? That's where that came from. It's the prophecy of those bones that were dead, and the Lord breathes life into them and brings them back and makes them living again. That's God's power, not only for the Israelites, but for us today. That He wants to live in us. He wants to make us alive and whole and well. And as we think about the exile, and Ezekiel was there trying to encourage the people to get back to God, serve Him because He's going to bring them back someday. He's going to make a way for them. There was another prophet too, Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was called while he was in the mother's womb, it says. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. You know, Jeremiah made excuses. He said, well, God, you can't really use me. I don't know how to speak very well. Moses said that same thing before God called him, didn't he? He said, I can't talk too well, Lord. I, I, I can't do this assignment you've given me. So God says, who is it that made your mouth? God enables those he calls. And we see that he did that through these people in the Old Testament that we read about, like Moses and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And these men, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, both had a vision of God. We sang that song, Let It Rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Ezekiel saw a vision of God. If you've read your chapter, you probably have read that. I encourage you to read your chapter and see and think about that Jeremiah also has a vision of God. He says, I saw the Lord. Wouldn't that be a neat thing? To have this vision of God, very God. And that we could worship him and understand him. He says he fell down and worshiped. He fell on his face in reverence and holiness to the Lord. And he felt empowered and equipped. He was enabled to do what God had asked him to do. And he knew who God was, even more so because of that time with God in his presence and seeing him. Lamentations 3.23, a book that Jeremiah wrote because he was called a weeping prophet. He was weeping because of the sins of the people. God said, 
on page 239 of your storybook, he said, you have as many gods as you have towns. It's almost like saying you have as many adulterous affairs as you can count on my hands. The analogy of people turning away and walking away, rebelling against God, is the picture that we want to see here and help us that we are not those kind of people that turn our back on God and walk away from His presence and rebel against Him and don't understand His house rules and what He wants for us so we can live an abundant, full life. In, Jer in Lamentations 3.23, Jeremiah knows the character of God. Not only is God true to what He said, but He's full of grace and compassion. And this is what it says. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for Him. That waiting is hard, isn't it? Because we want microwave. We want instant answers. We want instant fixes. If we're sick, we want to be well yesterday. If we have financial trouble, we want that taken care of earlier than later. If we have relationship problems, we don't want to deal with it. We just kind of want to walk away. But God wants to give us bounty and blessing and goodness. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks Him. It is good to wait patiently for the salvation of the Lord. God is faithful. The entire point of God's judgment of Judah, the southern tribes now, Israel was already taken captive, went to the Assyrians, wicked people. The Babylonians were the great world power that were even bigger than the Assyrians, and now they were coming and they were plundering Judah. And as the prophets even said, Lord, why do you allow such wicked people to take over? Habakkuk talks about that, one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Why do you allow such wicked people to take over your people? The entire point of God's judgment of Judah was to get their attention and remind them of his promise. A king would come from their tribe so that they had to reflect the character of the king. Their banishment would be temporary as God prepared them for this magnificent moment in history. He says, I will gather and you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Maybe you could say adulteries. And all your gods, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit in you, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. These are the wonderful words of hope to the people in exile who had been banished from God's presence because of their turning their back on the relationship. God loves us and wants to be in relationship with his people and with us today. Can you draw the lines? to connect to us today. And sometimes as we forsake the Lord, we don't take time to be in His presence, we don't take time in His Word, we don't take time with Him, because we're too busy. We're too busy doing good things, but yet we're kind of avoiding being in God's presence. We're maybe not listening to God's Word and what He would ask us and how to live and the behavior and the character that He invites us to into as his children, into his house, into this wonderful place of fellowship and provision and care by our Father who wants to be all in all to us. As we think about the Lord today, I would encourage you this week to think about people that you rub shoulders with. Maybe it's a guy you work with. Maybe it's a woman you jog with or a teenager with an attitude, of course nobody in this room, but some out there, perhaps. Or maybe some other adults with attitudes. It could be anyone we cross paths with, but in the upper story, they are like these exiles. 
that are out there doing their own thing. And they're longing to connect with God and find their way back home. To know God's love and care and provision. Many have ignored the warnings and they've hit their own icebergs. And they're drowning in the freezing waters of life. Longing for someone to throw them a lifeline. Tell them about Jesus and how much he loves them. Tell them that God cared enough to send Jesus. Cared enough to give us an eternal life, an eternal home in heaven, to be with him in his presence forever. They're frightened, they're confused, they're worn out, they're lonely, yet they're precious in God's sight. Let us be that voice of God to those who are in exile this week and call them home to God, to know his great love and compassion that is new every morning. You know, sometimes we struggle, don't we, in our relationship with God. But let me emphasize today that God loves you. He loves you more than anybody in this world can love you. Thankfully, we have family that love us. We have spouses that love us. We have children and parents and relatives. But God loves you more than anyone can love you. And he wants you to be with him in his presence. Not only on this earth to experience his presence and power day by day, but to be in a home in heaven forever, eternal life. No matter what you're going through, if you feel like you're that one in exile today, God is going to be with you. His mercies are new. His compassions every morning they'll be coming to you. He's faithful, God. He loves you. He wants to be your all in all. He is that kind of God. So let's welcome him in today. Let's invite him in our hearts. Let's know that his spirit, the Lord has promised his Holy Spirit to be with us and in us. We don't just have to act on our own. We're not alone, but God is with us. His Holy Spirit is with us. You kids that are in school, the Holy Spirit is with you as you go. As you're there wondering how you're supposed to relate to these kids and some of the problems they might have and how you deal with people. The people on the street, the people at the market, the people you meet during the week, they are looking for answers, many of them. Will you be looking to share that life of Christ with them this week? Lord, help us to be the people of God that know the way to heaven and share it with those who are struggling, who are on their way to the cold waters. Without God, let us share the light and the love of Christ. As we think about this chapter, we know there's this ending that is encouragement and strength. God will bring us back. God always provides a way back. Let that be an encouragement to you today. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to end, but are new every morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, you are greater and bigger than anything we know. You are more powerful and able than anyone, any being that we know of. You are God alone. We stand humbled before you, God, in your presence, that you would love us. As we are many times like the children of Israel who wandered from you, who rebelled, who turned their backs, says, Lord, we don't really want to be with you. We can't. We can't keep all your house rules. There are just too many. We're going to do our own thing. But God, I pray today that in this room, every person, man, woman, and child, would surrender hearts, souls, and minds completely to your love and your care today. Come into our hearts, our lives. Lead us, Spirit of God. May we be people about your work and kingdom. May we know that you have mercies that are new every morning. 
And even when we mess up, even when we're, when we're in exile, you are there lovingly calling us back because you love us so much. I pray for encouragement today for people here in the pews that need that touch of your spirit upon them. For joy that would come into their hearts and lives. To know that they can make it through this one more test and trial. I pray, God, that you will work in each of us, that every part of our lives will be surrendered to you and who you are. As our Heavenly Parent who loves us immensely and knows the best for our lives. So come in us today, God. And may we surrender completely to you as we lay down our lives before you and humbly receive your grace and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. On your connection card, Joyce is coming. To help us with the offering. But on your connection card, there's those three in the back steps. That, next steps, I will read the story in the next chapter. I will be faithful to God and keep His commands. I will take time to grow my relationship stronger with God each day. If you can mark any or all of those, I encourage you to do so. We'll be praying with you this way. Thank you, Joyce. Well, we've given something to take home with us, haven't we? And that's what the next steps are for. So, in a moment, we'll be receiving the offering. And this is a time to put your connection card in the offering plate as it goes by the bucket. And so just a reminder to write, fill in the blanks for the next steps. And it's a declaration of your response to the service, to the sermon, to show what you are going to do and to also make that um, commitment to ourselves, how we are going to respond to it. So uh, it kind of cements it and it's better. So um, remember, if you're a first-time guest, you get a book. So come and find Pastor Judy, Pastor John, and me, and you'll get that. Um, just remember to complete that card as well, connection card. Um, and we'd love to meet you. So as the offering ushers come forward, we just want to remind you that this is a member-supported church. And so all of the ministries that go on at Fourth Avenue, as well as um, what's given to the to the UMC, United Methodist Church, comes from your tithes and offerings. Do you know the difference between a tithe and an offering? A tithe is 10% of whatever we make. That might seem like a lot, but Pastor Judy and John did not ask me to share this, but because I'm not a paid member, it's probably a little easier for me because there's no need for people to wonder, well, what am I getting out of it? Sometimes people think, Asking for money is a way to just fill pockets, but it's a way to do God's work. But not only that, it's a way to bless us. And there's a verse from Matthew 6.21 and also Luke 12.34. And it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We sometimes think where our heart is, that's where our treasure is going to go. But Jesus said, no, it's where our treasure is, where is where our heart will be. So if you want to grow more in the Lord, if you want to get closer to Him, God says this is a way to do that. Put your money where you want your heart to be, and your heart will follow. So who doesn't want to grow closer to the Lord? Um, in fact, the NLT says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. So um, you have good promises, good blessings, not only for the people that you are blessed and reward for them, but also in your own life and serving God. Thank you. Jean, let you.
Please stand with me for the closing prayer. Lord, hear us now as believers we join our voices together to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. On the screen is a benediction. It's a scripture from Lamentations again. Let us together say these words. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. May we know God's faithfulness and the hope of the Lord this week. God bless you as you go. Greet each other in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, God.